Hello and welcome to Positive Talk. We still continue with our issue that we're focusing on last week, an issue that is not only seizing Zimbabwe, but the rest of the world. Issues of uh, non-communicable diseases and our special focus has been on uh, breast cancer. We're still going to have uh, one breast cancer survivor sharing their story. And then the next two segments, we're going to be joined by uh, a medical e expert, uh, Dr. Edwin Nguti, who's going to really enlighten us as Zimbabweans to then say, yes, we are with witnessing an increase in issues of uh, uh, breast cancer, cancers in general, other NCDs. What do we need to do to protect ourselves? And um, on the program now, I'm joined by uh, Mrs. Faris Takawira. She's um, a breast cancer survivor, like I said. Welcome to Positive Talk. Thank you, Tarira. Hello. We want you to share with us um, your journey. Kuti Muzoti, Muzo Ziva, Kuti, I've got breast cancer. What happened? What did you do? How are you surviving now? Okay, it, uh, it all started in 2008 when I noticed a lump on my breast and on the armpit. Um, I had read about breast cancer and when I saw the lump immediately I knew that there is something wrong. I, I quickly went to a friend doctor. She told me to go straight to World Woman Clinic and get tested for breast cancer. So that's when, that's when I went to World Woman Clinic and they, they did their tests and they referred me further to have that lump removed so that they could see if it was a cancerous lump. Mm -hmm. Both the lump on the underarm and the one on, the, on my breast. Mm -hmm. So in um, March 2008 I went for the lumpectomy and uh, immediately I think in four days the results came out. The um, surgeon told me that it was breast cancer, stage three. I, I went to the doctor with my husband. So my husband remained outside when I went in. So as soon as the doctor told me that it was breast cancer, I said, let me call my husband. My husband came in and he was told the news. I, I think for me, it, it impacted only more than with me. So we were referred to the cancer center for, for, for counseling before anything else. So. I went to the cancer center and uh, met with Sister Agatha, who, who counseled me. She told me she, she was 18 years survivor. So that gave me a lot of hope and, um, and faith that ah, this can be cured mm. or I can go through this. And um, so I went for the mastectomy in, in, in May, in March, and in April I, I started the chemotherapy. Yeah, that was, the, that was the most difficult time. The six months that I went through chemotherapy were very difficult. Um, it, you know how chemo is, the loss of hair, um, and you know, you can't go to where places are gathered because you are, you, you are immu your, your immune system is suppressed and you can catch up any any infection mm. so it was like you just have to stay at home and go for chemo stay at home but i thank god i managed what it what would, would you say inspires you because from 2008 and for me when you said stage three mm. because we often hear it's stage four i know dr mguti is going to clarify that for us but for me stage three it's a bit late but uh, you were, you managed to be to be to be to be treated and here you are 12 um, Almost uh, 10 years later, you are still here, healthy. How did you survive? It's only the grace of God. It's only the grace of God because during that time, I also had, like you are saying, stage two. I also had stage two friends whom I was doing chemo with mm. who, are, who are no longer with us. So that's why I say it's just the grace of God. The community. Um, last week we heard from some who were talking about there's an element of stigmatization. People still don't understand um, how are you coping with the community? How are you also encouraging other people to actually go for uh, screening? Because we, from everything what we are learning is uh, early detection is important. Yeah, the community, I think for me, it was, I, I got a lot of support even from my neighbors from the neighborhood because immediately after the diagnosis I told everyone I didn't hide my family 
my relatives, the community, the church, everyone was very mm -hmm. supportive, even the workplace. They really supported me. Yeah. Then when we're looking at um, uh, issues of uh, treatment, how easy was it for you? Uh, we had one person last week saying uh, for some services she had to go to South Africa. It's uh, also costly. For you, how was it? It was a difficult period for, for, for us as a family. And you know, 2008 was a difficult year for everyone in Zimbabwe. And the medication was not, was not easily accessible. We had to source our own medication. It was very difficult, but we just thank God that we managed, we sailed. We managed to get all the medication and everything that was done. Unfortunately, I couldn't do radiotherapy because that particular time, each time you would go for radi radiation, the machine would break down after maybe three treatments. And then after that, you have to wait for it. They say the doctors are coming from, was it Germany, to fix the machines. And then once, I think after three weeks, and then you have to go back again. So I said, no, I can't do this. I can say that uh, cancer treatment in Zimbabwe is very, very expensive. And um, for me, when I look at it, uh, we only have two centers of treatment. That's Bulawayo and Harare. We are also lobbying and crying. Can this be decentralized? Because you find women coming from far, and some cannot even afford. That's why you find most women don't even want to have those diagnoses. Because what then after that? Because they can't access the treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's our cry. So what message yeah. would you like to give uh, to Zimbabweans regarding the importance of them knowing their bodies, uh, them to be able to detect any change, any major change that happens to their bodies? Yeah, it's, it's something that we as Zimbabweans don't take seriously. Because you know when, when I told people that I had a lamp, they would just say it, it will just disappear. Don't worry about it. And people are not educated about these diseases, especially with breast cancer, cervical cancer, and other cancers. People always think that uh, once you're diagnosed with cancer, that's your, your death sentence. You know, you are like, tomorrow you're going to die. But only God knows when one <laughs> will die. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think people need to know to be educated. Because even right now as we are talking, if you ask women if they, do they examine themselves, they don't. Nobody does. It's only a few who do that. Yeah, so we, we, I have, we, we have a group of breast cancer survivors. We are opting for that. So we are lobbying for all that, the awareness and things like that. So yeah, we, we, I think we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, join us after the break. I don't even need to reinforce the importance of us knowing an, our, our bodies. That self-examination that we all, all, always hear about, we are constantly being reminded. But what is lacking is the taking action. I think from today onwards, this has to be a routine in our lives. Join us after the break when Dr. Mguti is going to be clarifying to us. Uh, she is saying she has um, been cured. And for me, the question that I have is, can breast cancer be cured? Can other cancers be cured? He is going to clarify all that for us. Join us. Welcome back. We continue with our program and uh, like I promised, we are now joined uh, by uh, Dr. Edwin Mguti. He is a um, former Minister of uh, Health here in Zimbabwe. He is uh, a consultant surgeon. Uh, he is um, also the founder of a breast clinic at Pararenyatwa Hospital. So he has uh, quite a lot of experience when it comes to issues of um, uh, breast cancer what we want to find out from him as Zimbabweans and I'm sure these are the questions that uh, that we have breast cancer can it be treated um, how early do I need uh, to go to them 
issues of staging that we were hearing last week and even this week in our first segment. He is going to be elaborating all that for us. Dr. Mgutu, welcome to Positive Talk. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, we want to find out um, breast cancer in Zimbabwe. Statistics are shocking and it's showing that it's increasing. Or is it increasing or there's awareness? I want to first establish that from you. Well, <clears throat> I think um, we are seeing it more and more. And as you correctly say, when you see a condition more and more, it's either it's increasing or it's being detected more and more. People are more aware. So you can have a disease in the community and people are not aware of it and you won't know. So I think right now with the, the awareness campaigns that have been taking place, more and more people are coming. So you can say yes, on our records it's increasing, but that does not equate to an absolute increase in the in the incidence of the disease in the, the community. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of women uh, were coming and they were saying, I detected, um, when I went it was detected at stage 3, one was saying stage 4, stage 2, women would want to know what is this staging, what does it mean for me if I come to you and you are telling me you are stage 3, you are stage 2. Yeah, I would like to say those are more technical issues, uh, more to do with um, the quantification of the disease and how extensive it is and how, how, how far down the line it is. So stage one is the earliest form, stage two is a little bit later, stage three. Stage four is the, is the worst form of the disease. But uh, for the, the women out there, the community in general, I shouldn't want to worry them too much with the technical details mm. because it's a guide for us, the clinicians. It's medical practice. Yeah, because if we... So why do you tell us then? Just for general information, but the problem now is people will then go to Google and, yeah. and they see horrendous That's where the uh, pictures. Is. So sometimes we limit the amount of information we give. It's, it's, it's a delicate balance. Some people want more information, others want less. But basically, stage one is more is uh, more likely to be cured than stage three and four. Mm -hmm. However, each one of the stages has got a treatment a protocol which is attached to it, which is appropriate for it. So basically, if you have stage one, a simple operation to remove the, the lump can be curative. Stage two as well. Stage three, you then need surgery plus chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those stages, they are mainly for the clinicians. And we, I, I don't believe that clinicians should give out too much information which would have the effect of scaring away the patient. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's also quite devastating. And, uh, you know, the person is told you are stage four, you know. Well, what does it mean to you? You know what I mean? So I think clinicians have to be careful how much information they give and uh, not necessarily to hide information, mm -hmm. but to give it in a more humane and uh, progressive manner. Yeah. So for instance, mm -hmm. um, as a woman, for me now, I'm thinking, if it's going to come to me, then I need to come to you when it's stage one. What are the steps that women need to do for you to then say, I'm detecting? Yes, we are celebrating October Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There is that awareness that we are creating. But what exactly are we telling women to do? To tangira papi Um the most important thing is for the women and men as well, because men also get uh, breast cancer, is to be vigilant. Yeah, be uh, conscious. Their health-seeking behavior should be uh, conscious. They should not wait if they detect any abnormality whatsoever, even if it's not a cancer. It's better to go to the relevant clinician to get checked out, and you are declared to be free from the condition, than to wait. Procrastination is the biggest problem that we see in society. And it's not only uh, associated with uh, the poor and the lowly educated. No, we've seen highly educated people with PhDs coming late. Because there are a lot of psychological issues as well. People are scared, they're terrified of the di possible diagnosis of cancer. So because of that, some will opt to, to stay in a cocoon you know, and hope for the best. Yeah. So you, you, I think awareness campaigns and counseling services, people should know what services are available, where to access them, and they should be accessed easily so that, you know, people can benefit mm -hmm. better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on me, on my body, mm -hmm. on my breast, what do I need to do? I want to hear it from you now. First of all, you need to know about your family history because there is a family 
association in breast cancer. It's not very common, but it's there. So if you have any relatives, blood relatives, not your husband, or <laughs> but your blood relatives who have had breast cancer, or who have had any other cancer for that matter, prostate cancer, stomach cancer, any cancer, you, that puts you in a higher risk of cancer in general. Okay, so if you know your family history and you know that there's somebody who has had cancer in your family, you should uh, make moves to, to get checked out. Okay, number one. Number two, be self-conscious. Uh, there are a lot of cyclical changes that happen to the woman's body throughout the monthly cycle. Okay, so breasts do change in configuration and uh, texture throughout the month. So you, you should be familiar with your own breasts. How do they feel? If you detect any change whatsoever, it doesn't have to be a lump necessarily. Mm. The lump is the most common, but it can be a change in how you feel about them, how they look, how you whether there's an itch or a lump, any change whatsoever, any deviation from from the normal, mm. you should go and uh, get checked out. And your clinical evaluation consists of um, the clinician will talk to you, then they will examine your breasts and they will try to detect any abnormalities. Mm -hmm. Then further to that, there are tests that can be done which will detect problems which may not necessarily be detectable by pure, by simple examination. Mm -hmm. So we have ultrasound scan, we have um, a mammography. Eh? These are special x-rays which are taken of the breast and they are able to identify any suspicious areas. When we say suspicious, we mean an area which we think could be cancerous. Mm. If that is detected, we then take a small piece of tissue, we're using a needle, yeah, on, from that particular area, which we submit to to the lab, the histology lab. They will look at the, the cells, the structure of the cells, and tell us whether it's cancer or not. If it's a cancer, what grade is it, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, you have heard it. I think from last week, what we're talking about, when we're talking about uh, breast cancer, it was the issue of the lump. But the doctor has even told us, and there is a lamp chat, any abnormality from our breast as do. So as men, as women, let's be conscious about that. Join us after the break. Welcome back. We continue with our discussion where we are looking at uh, issues of uh, breast cancer and in this segment we also try and touch on some NCDs that we are witnessing as Zimbabweans. Um, but Chiremba, apandruku da kuti mbotitsa na ngurira. Nyaya yenjimbo zekuno rapka. My takawira mfei segment wa chema chema. I breast cancer se five. And cancer, irungo rapka uparinya atwa. That is uh, basically true. Each one, cancer treatment, uh, each treatment is highly specialized. I think we have to with smaller institutions because of the nature of the condition and the nature of the treatment facilities that have to be there the drugs used, the radiation and all those, it cannot be too decentralized. But I do agree that it can be decentralized, at least to provincial level, yes. But for you to successfully decentralize it, you need the personnel, which means the doctors and nurses who are fully trained and able to diagnose and treat the condition. Do we have them in Zimbabwe? We do, but maybe not enough. And also maybe the distribution is not appropriate because there tends to be people congregating in, in Arare. We have a, 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 what I would call a misdistribution, a maldistribution, mm. a skewed distribution, whereby most of our patients are out there mm. and most of the clinicians are in the city. But there are many social factors that, that cause that to happen. Yeah. So while this decentralization is good, uh, I would start off by first of all strengthening the services available 
at the central hospital to really bring them up to the highest standard possible. And then gradually decentralize to the provincial hospitals. Because mind you, there's, she talked about radiation and chemo. Yes. Radiation is very toxic and it, it's a double-edged sword. It can cure disease, it can also cause disease. So you have to, to really have sophisticated institutions which I do believe can be decentralized, at least to the provinces, to make it available closer to the people. But uh, it's not just a question of uh, saying, oh, we have a facility. But the facility has to be uh, uh, supported, you know, in terms of all its requirements, mm. yeah? The diagnostic services, maintenance, uh, make sure the drugs are available all the time, etc., etc. Because a, 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 a cancer patient who has started chemotherapy cannot afford to, to, to break and say, ah, that's how I'm stronger most of the next week, you know what I mean? You've got to, to maintain the treatment cycle. You have to be faithful to the treatment cycle until you complete it. If you break, then it means you start afresh, the cancer gets resistant, or it becomes even more aggressive, you see now. Safely as a country, can we say if I go to Arari Hospital, no, to Parenya Hospital, to Bulawayo, I guess it's United um, uh, Bulawayo Hospital, I can access all the services. I can't say it's we are up to to the standard that would want to be. You can get a lot of the services, most of them, but uh, the services are overwhelmed by the numbers because you know the, we are, there are, these are two centres catering for a population of 14, 16 million people, and so there are also some issues uh, related to the general poor state of the economy. Okay, but I can assure, what I can assure you is we do have the necessary personnel to be able to handle most cancers, if not all. Yeah, we don't have to send our patients anywhere for treatment. We just need to improve our infrastructure and uh, our services in general. Then lastly, um, uh, Chiremba, Nyayema cancers in general, non-communicable diseases in general. Church cafe, because Van Margo Vunza Shishua. Prostate cancer, It's almost like angonyuka from nowhere. Yeah, that's a very interesting and very complicated question. I would try to answer it as much as I can. <coughs> it's multifactorial. There have been so many changes in uh, the demographics of the country, in the living conditions, yeah? The food we eat has also changed over the generations. I can tell you that I have a few relatives who are more than 100 years old. and They are not exposed to the stresses that were exposed in, in town, you know, cars spewing out uh, fumes, people are now smoking when they never used to smoke alcohol, the diet has also changed, yeah? You have people wanting to go blind, and you consume a huge amount of meat over a short space of time. Your body is not designed for that, yeah? So I can't be specific and say uh, it's because of ABC, but definitely lifestyle changes have had an effect on this uh, upsurge in cancers. Uh, some studies were done in the past where they looked at um, uh, Japanese people that emigrated to the United States after the Second World War. And it was seen that uh, they started to adopt or to acquire the diseases that were never common in Japan mm. simply by moving over to the United States. So the question was, but why? Mm. It's the environment, you see? So we have to modify our environment and make sure that uh, any known causes of cancer should, we should try to avoid them by uh, as much as possible. Yeah. Why should people smoke, for example? Why should people uh, consume an excessive amount of alcohol? Our parents and the grandparents they never used to do that. Yes. So that's the answer I can give. That applies even to diabetes, high blood pressure, blah, 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 all these things. Yeah. Mm. Well, you heard it, uh, Zimbabwe. I know this is a question that uh, we have had so many times and people are asking and they'll continue asking but I think the, the doctor has done um, a lot of justice. Our lifestyles, our lifestyles, our lifestyles. We really have to take care of ourselves. Watch, watch what we eat, exercise, do everything that we know is good for our health.
Gango is nice, I know. I also love Gango. But if it's damaging our borders, why are we doing this? So let's think about what we are doing ourselves, you know. Limit some of these things. Enjoy them. But you know, anything that is enjoyed to excess is not good anymore. And then also another thing. Let's be supportive of our community members. If we hear somebody's not feeling well, let's just find out. Manon's way. Even when we family, you heard Dr. Muguti saying, sometimes it's because of your family history. And from there, we can learn and save lives. Like I said last week, Zimbabwe. Let's share the information. Let's save lives. Let's build a better Zimbabwe.